Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship this morning. It is the first Sunday of Advent. Uh, this is the Sunday of hope. So welcome to Advent season. Advent is a, an old or ancient word that means coming or arrival. And we, we remember the arrival of the Son of God, Jesus born in Bethlehem. So we remember the first Advent and we're looking ahead with expectation and hope for his second coming, his, his next arrival. And so it's a season of preparation, preparing our hearts uh, to rejoice at the birth of Jesus. It's a season of preparation to remember that we have hope in a God who is going to make all things well uh, and is doing so through Jesus Christ already. So welcome to worship, welcome to the season of Advent. Uh, hopefully you enjoy the, the decorations that we had a crew do a lot of hard work on. So thank you decorating crew uh, for this uh, wonderful festive atmosphere, and uh, it's going to be good to, to worship together in this season. Uh, just some announcements we have before worship. I want to remind you of some of the Christmas giving options we have. We're, we're receiving offerings online and in person for uh, the food vouchers and food boxes that we're going to give to 32 families in need uh, or, or individuals as well. So if you know of somebody in need, let me know. Uh, could be a senior on fixed income, could be uh, somebody, uh, a family in need. It, uh, if they just need uh, some extra food and a food, food voucher, uh, we'd love to bless them. If you uh, would like to give to the Uganda Christmas party, each year we take a take offerings during this month and we try to throw them a party. Uh, we just send the money, they buy the soda pop and, and good food and uh, and have a good time and hopefully have enough uh, funds for a set of clothing and some shoes or sandals for the kids. So that we're doing as well. And then Lakeland Village, we heard Peggy Collier share about that last week. Most of the gifts are taken care of by her shopping and, and offerings from last year. And then several of you picked up envelopes to buy some of the gifts yourself. There are three envelopes remaining out there in the, the hallway. So if there's anybody who wants to shop themselves and get some of those uh, gifts to bless some of the residents up at Lakeland Village. There's three envelopes left. And if you bring stuff in for Lakeland Village residents, you can just leave it there and Peggy will find it and package it up and, and deliver it. Um, there's also some, some simple jewelry from Uganda that we still have left over from past years. And if you wanna buy any of that as a Christmas present, you can just leave offerings there for that and that will go also to the Uganda uh, Christmas party stuff. Let's see, is there any other announcements? Oh, yeah. Um, so next week uh, at our home, which is just 200 East Maxwell, but don't put that in your phone. You won't find it. Um, it's, it's a block that away towards Idaho, right? And then a block that away towards the North Pole, okay? So, uh, or towards Spokane. So it's a block that way, block that way, and then you go down to the end of the road, and it's the greenhouse on the right. And we have plenty of parking now. If you haven't been there, the there's extra parking, uh, and we'd love to have you there uh, for lots of goodies. So the house has uh, been a factory of goodies, not just fruitcake. I know I always talk about the fruitcake, but some other special treats that Tina makes. And we also have a Christmas card for each one of you uh, and our family letter with that. So, and you think, how am I on your mailing list? Well, you are. I don't know how Tina does it, but she does. So, uh, so come and get some cookies and spend some time at our home. We'd love to have you. And let's see. I think that's it. Let's pray as we begin our time of worship together. Oh God, we thank you that you are the God who is with us. You are Emmanuel, the God who draws near. Uh, and we rejoice in your goodness. We rejoice in our Lord and Savior Jesus for his advent, for his coming into this world to save and rescue us. And we, we long to praise you, Father. And so we ask that your Holy Spirit would would guide us today and aid us in worship of you. Whatever we're thinking about, whatever we're, we're going through, whatever we're feeling in our bodies or in our emotions today, focus it all on you in some way uh, to worship you, to hear encouraging truth from your word, Lord, and to be prepared uh, to serve you this upcoming week. So we give you ourselves, we give you this time, Lord, and we pray that you would be glorified. Pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Would you stand for our call to worship? Stand if you're able for our call to worship, and we'll begin worship together. The first reading is from Psalm 80, 1 through 7, 
and 17 through 19. Give, <coughs> give ear, O shepherd of Israel, you who lead Joseph like a flock, you who are enthroned upon the cherubim, shine forth. Before Ephraim and Benjamin and Manasseh, stir up your might and come and save us. Restore us, O God. Let your face shine that we may be saved. O Lord God of hosts, how long will you be angry with your people's prayers? You have fed them with the bread of tears and given them tears to drink in full measure. You make us an object of contention for our neighbors, and our enemies laugh among themselves. Restore us, O God of hosts. Let your face shine that we might be saved. But let your hand be on the man of your right hand, the son of man whom you have made strong for yourself. Then we shall not turn back from you. Give us life, and we will call upon your name. Restore us, O Lord of hosts. Let your face shine that we might be saved. Please join us in singing Savior like a shepherd lead us, and dear Lord and Savior of mankind.
There's lots to be excited. You can go back one slide for a sec. There's lots to be excited about this season. I mean, Idaho yesterday, did anybody watch that game? Some of you did. Wow. Some of you are here in church because you made a deal with God uh, yesterday, and, and they came through. Betty's like, yeah, that's why she's here. Anyway, no. Uh, they came through in overtime. If you didn't, sorry if you recorded it. Uh, but, uh, but uh, yeah. Yeah. <coughs> um, Basketball season has started, so lots of bleacher sitting for some of us, but that's joyous and good. And then the festivities of the season, um, right? The, the, the Christmas season is upon us, and that's exciting and good, but it, it's something we need to recognize, and we try to do this at the start of every season. It's not easy for everybody, right? Um, many of us have lost loved ones recently in the last year or in distant times and the season can can bring back difficult memories and there and there's also those who struggle just with stress and uh, depression or seasonal depression and um, you know one of our our focus uh, the focus we have in ministry that some churches don't have is mental health mental health ministry and there's several of you on the team with me and we do uh, outreaches and trainings and it's just something we do caring for the mental health of our community and and offering trainings. And so as our ministry spotlight today, I want, I want us to, to think about some things, and this is tough stuff to think about at holidays, but I think important, things we can be praying for. Folks who are uh, going through stress, and, and even those who are thinking about ending the greatest gift God gives us besides salvation, that's the, the gift of life, right? And uh, the 2022 statistics came out for suicide recently. They of course, leg behind a year, and unfortunately, though, suicides in America had reduced for a year, uh, they went up again um, in 2022, and, uh, and uh, some good news in this news is that the suicide rate that had been increasing amongst uh, uh, young adults and youth, uh, it, it had been increasing, it went down finally this in 2022, and, that, 2022, and that's, that's good news, but the rates among women, um, younger women, adult women, uh, are going up dramatically, and they don't really know that till they gather all the statistics nationwide, and then they see a trend, and that's, that's a shocking trend, whether that's just extra stress uh, in, in families, um, not really sure why that is, but it's something to, to pray for, and we've seen even these impacts uh, locally in Whitman County and in our communities. So in, in this season, uh, you can go ahead and go back to those candles, and um, I just, I want us to be uh, praying for, uh, for joy, uh, for hope, for peace. Uh, these are things we, we pray for, uh, but also knowing that there are some that struggle uh, with, with maybe a mental health challenge or just with grief and stress, and we want to be praying for all of that and looking for ways we can bless our neighbors, our friends, and our family in this time. And so if you are struggling with any of those things, we want to be praying for you, and I'm always Welcome to talk with you or find resources to help you um, experience God's peace even in the midst of hard times. Uh, we're gonna go to prayer together, one of the great gifts God's given us to help us through uh, the ups and downs of life and just great times with him, relationship with him. Let's pray together as Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Oh God, we, we do have hope in you. Uh, you are the God who loves us and draws near to us. And your word says you are near to the brokenhearted. You save the crushed in spirit. You catch our tears in a bottle, Lord. You are the God who sees. You are the God who hears. You are the God who cares. You are the God who draws near, the God of Advent. And so we, we have hope in you. We recognize, Lord, that in this season when the days are short, and the darkness can seem very long and difficult for many people. We recognize uh, that you uh, are calling us to, to serve one another. So Lord, deepen our compassion for one another. Help us to reach out and check in with one another this season. Help us to find ways to bless one another inside the church community and, and way beyond, Lord. Help us to, to share your hope. 
Help us to share the light of Jesus. Help us to be praying faithfully and regularly for people. And Lord, we do um, pray especially for those who, who are not seeing good answers in their life, who are, who are thinking even about suicide. We pray that we could help uh, puncture that thought process and bring light into that tunnel, Lord, that your hope could come in uh, to there, into their hearts, into their lives. God, we also lift up to you another hopeful, joyous thing, the, the youth retreat up at Ross Point. Uh, wrapping up today, Lord, we thank you for each of those 38 kids up there and the seven kids from our area and youth groups. Lord, we give you thanks. We pray for uh, Pastor Dean Walker as he gives his last messages today. Lord, may you, you just open the hearts of those kids and uh, Lord, may it be a great time. May they draw closer to you. I pray for Wa Ming and thank you for his gifts and service there, Lord. Uh, may you be glorified in all of that. Uh, Lord, we do lift up our, our outreaches, our Christmas outreaches, and we ask that you would provide and uh, just help bless the people that really need it, God. Whether it's in the ends of the earth in Uganda, whether it's our, our nearby neighbors in need of some extra food or, or the Lakeland folks, Lord, we, we just give that all to you and we ask that you would reach the people who could be blessed and draw, draw people closer to you or or use this as a witness for people who, who don't know you or don't know about your goodness, God. Um, and Lord, I pray for those gathered here and, and, and any online today. Lord, I pray for, for all of their concerns, knowing you, you can hear them, and we lift them up to you now, Lord. Our own issues in our own individual lives and in our families, the things we care about in this world, the conflicts in this world, Lord. We lift these things up to you. We ask you to help us know what we are called to and, and what we are not called to. We ask you to help us be your hands and feet this week. We ask you to help us strive for holiness and humility this week. And may you, uh, may you shine your light through us. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, we're going to continue in worship with our next scripture and song. The second reading is, for, is from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 through 9. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that was given you in Christ Jesus, that in every way you were enriched in him in all speech and all knowledge, even as testimony about Christ was confirming among you, so that you are not lacking in any gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will sustain you to the end, guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful, by whom you were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord.
If you want to turn in your Bibles or a Bible provided for you, or your Bible device, whatever you got there, Bible app, I should say, you go to the Gospel of Luke, chapter uh, 2, fourth book in the New Testament, Matthew, or third book, excuse me, Matthew, Mark, Luke, yep, 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 I went to graduate school to learn that. Okay, uh, Luke 2 today, part of the Christmas story, um, so this, this Advent season, we're going to be doing something called uh, the Outcasts of Advent in our Bible studies and in our messages, and looking at the different characters and how God uses what the world might call as outcasts and draws them in to his story. Uh, so this word has been on my mind, outcasts, and uh, we're going to be thinking of these shepherd outcasts, but in a way, we're all outcasts. Uh, you know, we are cast out of perfection. We don't, we don't live in a perfect world. Uh, we, we live in a world that has brokenness, right? And on our own, we're, we've been cast out, according to the scripture, out of God's perfect family, but we have this God who wants to draw us in, right? Uh, so it's not a very cheery idea for a pastor to get up and all the decorations and say, hey, you're a bunch of outcasts, right? Uh, but this, this is part of the story. Um, so we need to think about this and feel this as we approach Christmas in the season of Advent, that God has this repeated over and over again through history and evidenced in our lives here as well uh, of using outcasts, or what the world might call outcasts, to advance his story of love and salvation, right? Let's think about this. He, he asked Abraham to leave his family and go to a, another land, right? He used Moses, who literally as a baby was cast out on the waters, right, and then ran away from Egypt and became an outcast, right? He used Israel, the, the nation of Israel, even though they were cast out of their own land for disobedience at times, right? He used prophets like Elijah and Jeremiah, Hosea and Amos, who, who weren't popular in their times or had to do things that were unpopular. I mean, Amos was even from Tico. That's hard life, right? Okay. Uh, Tekoa is how you say it in the Bible. But I mean, uh, outcasts. God used these, these outcasts outside of the mainstream, unpopular, but they were telling God's message. And in Advent, the season that means God came to us, God arrived, and he's coming again, we consider that God used this, this outcast named John the Baptizer, or John the Baptist, right? He wasn't part of a Baptist denomination. He came and he was dunking people. He was doing this crazy thing out in the Jordan River where it was the, the Jordan River running through the desert area. He was taking people and dunking them in the water when they said they would repent of their sins, not a normal thing to do. And he wore camel's hair and he ate, he ate locusts and wild honey. He was way outside the mainstream. He was like some of those prophets of old, right? Like Elijah had come back or something. And people, for some reason, tens of thousands of people, maybe over 100,000 people were flocking to this movement of this outcast looking guy, John the baptizer, coming to say, you know what? I do need to get my life straight and prepare my life for the Lord because that's what John was preaching. He was saying, Prepare for the Lord, he's gonna return. His whole life, his parents, Elizabeth and Zechariah, they've been preparing him, John, to prepare the way for the Messiah to come. For 30 years about, John had been preparing this and he'd been told, you're gonna to help pave the way, in a sense, for the Messiah King, the Savior, is gonna come back and you're gonna help come from the outside and tell people to get their hearts ready. 30 years after the night of nights, when angels came and proclaimed the birth of the son of David, Christ, the king, the savior, the Lord. Proclaimed 30 years before John the Baptist came, proclaimed to some apparent outcasts, some shepherds, just some guys doing the night shift on that night of nights, what a night it was. Let's pray to hear the message in the scripture today. Lord, may the words of my mouth and, and the meditations of all of our hearts, may they be pleasing and acceptable in your sight, dear Lord, for you are our rock and our redeemer. You are the author and perfecter of our faith. You alone should we rightly revere and fear. You alone should we fully follow. You alone should our lives be founded upon, and you alone are the hope of the world. 
So may your Holy Spirit help us hear and see and experience the good news of great joy in a fresh way today. Lord, I know this story is familiar to many of these folks, but just because it's familiar to many of us, may we not grow accustomed to it. May we not be taken surprised by its greatness again. Right? We need to be surprised by its greatness again. That's what I'm trying to say, God. <laughs> so help us. And I pray that your people would pray for me and other preachers as we declare your word, your good news of great joy. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's hear about these shepherds. Uh, Luke 2, starting with verse 8. And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, fear not. For behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen, as it had been told them. This is the gospel of our Lord. And uh, isn't it an amazing story? Uh, it, it, this is a cool story, and it's also a weird story in some ways, and I don't mean to be insulting in, in any way by saying that. Uh, it's something that doesn't happen very often, and surely for these shepherds, it, it was a night like no other nights, right? Uh, angels. Angels are divine beings, right? They work in God's presence. These are, these are the angels who serve God. They're, they're very old, very ancient, very powerful beings, live and serve in God's presence, right? And they are coming back from wherever heaven is. It's pretty close, but it's, it's in another dimension, I guess you could say. There. Heaven, the, the veil between earth and heaven is torn open, and here they are on earth, and who do they come to? These, these, God, these God-serving ministers or messengers, they come to some guys who tend to sheep in fields, right? This this apparent contrast, contrast of you know, these divine-like beings who serve God and these human beings who serve sheep, right? Guard animals down here on earth. And, and, and the, these angels are telling them that a Savior, Christ, is going to be born in this nearby small town, Bethlehem. So I want us to think, well, you know, God obviously did this on purpose. He, he obviously is announcing this on purpose in this way. So why shepherds is a really good question for us to ask today. And I, I think God is wanting to make something really clear. He is coming to fulfill his plan to bring his children home. And so he is going to use shepherds because he is the shepherd. He's going to use shepherds to be his first Announcement. So the shepherds are out there and they're doing what they do, right? They're protecting their flock. And what do shepherds do? They protect their flock. They guide them to green pastures or find food for them to eat. They, they get them water, right, for them to live. They, they tend to the sick and the lame amongst the sheep. They, they go after the wandering and lost sheep. And that's what God does too, right? He, he protects the flock. He guides us to food. He he gives us living water for our souls. He tends to the sick, the hurting, the broken, 
and he goes after the lost, and he provides a secure home. That's what shepherds do. That's what the great shepherds do. So let's think about these shepherds. They were not looked upon uh, highly by most in the culture, and, and though they, it's an important job and we shouldn't look down on it, they, they weren't regarded as the most important for sure. And the religious elite or the religious teachers of, the, the, of Judaism that at that time looked down on them, uh, it was an unclean job, it was a seven day a week job, by, and so by the understanding of the religious teachers, these are unclean people and they're unobservant. They're, you know, they're, they're always out in the fields. Well, of course they are, right? So they're unobservant, they're unclean, and you know, yeah, we need their sheep. We'll use their sheep and we'll use their special spotless lambs for our sacrifices at the temple, but we'll also look down our noses at them, right? We'll have it both ways in a sense. And, and so they were seen as unclean. And this is really an unfair view. This is not God's view. And it was not a, it's not a universal view. Uh, many, of course, knew the hard and important work of the shepherds. Many knew and appreciated that, yeah, they raised the lambs that we use or the sheep we use for meat and for wool and the, the lambs that we, some of the lambs that we use for sacrifice at the temple. Where would we be without the shepherds, right? And, and so a lot of people appreciated them. And God, most importantly, appreciated the shepherds. He knew the importance of shepherds. And if you think about the Bible, and uh, God, if, if maybe some of you have familiarity with some shepherd stories, but God uses quite a number of shepherds in his ongoing story of the Bible. And more on that in a moment. But here, he's intentionally choosing to appear to these shepherds. Though they're outcasts to the religious folks, to the church folks, if we want to say it that way, Right? but they weren't outcasts to the Lord. He wanted to draw them into this most important chapter of his story, this most important night of nights. And really, his story has been including shepherds from the earliest of times. So let's think about shepherds in the Bible. Abel. Abel is one of the sons of Adam and Eve. That's almost as far back as you can go in the Bible, right? Uh, And Abel tended flocks. He was a shepherd, right? Now, Abel's life, sadly, was cut short. He was murdered by his brother, Cain. This is the first murder recorded in the Bible. The first murder murder in the Bible was that of a shepherd. God would never forget that, okay? God, God would continue to then use shepherds in his story. What was Moses doing when he saw the burning bush and called into this ministry? He was tending to his father in law's sheep. Jacob was a shepherd, and he was the father of many sons who became the the namesakes for the tribe of Israel, and Jacob himself became the namesake. His name became Israel. He was a shepherd. Amos, a prophet that I already mentioned, a shepherd from Tekoa. David, the king of kings, the human king of kings, not the king of kings, but the the, the most prized Jewish king of of their nation, the one who founded Jerusalem as the capital city. What was he doing before he was a king? Shepherd. Right? Those are just to name a few from the Bible. Now, God would also use shepherd and shepherd images and songs, and most of you uh, probably know the 23rd Psalm, and it's the shepherd psalm, right? The Lord is my shepherd. But there's also some tough stuff in the Bible about shepherds. Uh, Ezekiel, a prophet, uh, he, he was inspired to condemn to condemn the false shepherds of his day, the false religious leaders of his day. And and I just want to read to you from Ezekiel chapter 34, verse two. Ezekiel said, or, or this is in the book of Ezekiel, he was told to say this. Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, even to the shepherds. Thus says the Lord God, ah, shepherds of Israel who have been feeding yourselves, should not the shepherds feed the sheep? And then it goes on from there. It actually gets really intense, and Ezekiel is given this message from the Lord to share that there's false shepherds leading the people. There's people leading God's people astray. They're not really feeding them the truth. They're feeding them lies, right? And so we we see from God, when we look in the Bible, we see God wants God's people, he wants humans to be led well, to be given the truth, to be led compassionately, to be led fairly, and he hates it when there's unhealthy shepherds, when there's false shepherds. He wants shepherds of truth and love and justice, 
God wanted good shepherds for his people. Now, ultimately, his shepherd theme in the Bible is restored when he brings the ultimate great shepherd, Jesus, the one who will come and lead with truth, capital T. He is the truth, right? He's gonna be the shepherd, the best shepherd that comes with the deepest compassion and, and, and seeks the lost sheep. And he comes and what is, what is one of the things Jesus announces? We see it in the Gospel of John. He announces, I'm the great shepherd, right? And my sheep know my voice, right? So what I'm saying is there is a ton of intention or God is doing this story on purpose. He didn't just do this so we could have some figurines in our nativity set, right? Uh, he didn't just show up because he was like, well, Mary decided to have the baby at night, so who's awake, right? Got to find some guys out there. No, God is orchestrating this great story. He remembers the first blood spilt. He remembers his prophets who tried to lead well and the, the false shepherds who led poorly, and he, he is going to come and be the great shepherd, so he is going to use shepherds to hear the good news, to be the first witnesses outside the family, right? It's amazing the intention God has, the purpose he puts into his story. And there's so much, therefore, we can learn. So let's, let's learn from the shepherds a bit, okay? Uh, reverence. I, I think we can learn reverence from the shepherds. Uh, reverence is a word that I learned, you know, in Boy Scouts, should have learned it in church, but learned it in Boy Scouts, uh, reverence, we should rightly fear or deeply respect, revere God, right? Uh, they, I, I think we see this in the shepherds. They understood the message. Others may have looked down on them, but I, I think they had prepared and they'd heard the stories. They'd prayed the Jewish prayers for the Messiah. They, they, in a sense, were ready. We see that the angel announces it, but it doesn't say, and the angel had to go into great explanation of what he was talking about, <laughs> Right? He had to tell them who the son of David was. No. I think they were God-fearers, as the old language says, right? People who revered God and still had hope in these Messiah promises of old. And, and they revered God enough so they were good, faithful shepherds. I'm certain of that. They chose God's work that day over their work. They, they had to leave a large flock, right? But they, they made a choice, whether they left the flock with dogs or what, we don't know. We don't know the details, but they talked to each other and said, hey, we need to go and look at, into what this is, this is, right, that's just been announced to us. They knew what was most important. They, they knew, surely, that wolf or thief could come. Any night, a wolf or a thief could come to their flock. But I think they had enough reverence that they also had probably a basic, what I could call spiritual logic, and I hope we have this too as we have reverence, is, well, if God has called me to something, then can't God also protect my other things? And if he chooses to let a wolf or a thief come, he knew that too. I mean, after all, he brought all the angelic hosts that night, and he announced it to us, so let's go do the thing that God has called us to do. Reverence helps us to get over some of the earthly fears we have. You see, and this is why I still pray about fearing God, because when you rightly fear God and you really have reverence, then God helps you get over some of those earthly fears. Oh, should I really step out and share my faith, right? Oh, should I really step into this new thing God's calling me to do? If God is calling you to do it, don't worry about those other things. The things of the world will go strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace, right? So they revered God. And yes, it was an obvious scene and an obvious choice, but it's a, it's a lesson they teach us, right? And I, I just want to say reverence is sorely missing in our culture today, and I'm not just talking about outside the church. I'm talking about inside the church, right? And uh, we need reverence. We don't need, you know, flashiness. We don't need smoke machines. We don't need flashy ministries, I think we would all, whatever stripe of Christianity we are, we would all be better served if we were just deep, more deeply revering God in our worship, right, in our spiritual life. Reverence. God's plan first, God's ways first, God above work, God above family, God above everything, and he will help us take care of everything rightly. Reverence. Have you been excited about reverence before? I'm guessing some of you haven't. That's okay. Today's the day. 
Okay, moving on. Humility. Humility. They were humble. Humble. We don't even know their names. Christian tradition does not record their names. They are the first non-family witnesses of the baby Jesus, and we don't have like Bob, Ralph, whatever. I mean, the story was bigger than them. They got that. Okay, now obviously they, they don't disregard the announcement. They, they, they do the obvious thing and go follow, you know, the message where the message told them to go. But I want to think about that too. They don't what, have what some people inside the, uh, the church have, and that's called false humility. False humility is pride. pride. We usually think of pride of thinking of ourselves too great, like I'm the best, whatever. That's, that's pride. But there's this type of false humility that's often amongst religious people of, oh, I'm the worst. Oh, I can't go see baby Jesus. I didn't, you know, wash my hands good enough. And, and so they didn't say, we, we, we shouldn't go, guys. We're unclean. Remember what the religious guy said to us? We're unclean. They accepted the identity God has for them. That's humility. They didn't think of themselves too highly. They didn't think of themselves too low, right? They humbly received and recognized God's identity of themselves. And so they make the obvious choice to go. But that obvious choice to go and to leave their flock, it, just remember, it goes against the religious advice of that day, right? They are basically choosing hey, we're gonna go against the religious stream of that day and we're gonna follow the Lord's lead because he sent his angels to us. We should, right? We need that type of humility that may seem like common sense, but common sense isn't as common, some are saying, right? So we, if God has called you to it, don't think too lowly of yourself or too high. If he's called you to be part of his body, he says. You might be the hand, you might be the foot, you might be the nose, you've got your different gifts, but if he's given them to you, He's calling you to do that. He's called you to be a person who prays. He's called you to be a person who, who serves in your family. He didn't put you in your relationships by accident. Just kind of lean into that. Don't say, oh, but I can't ever share my faith, or I won't ever have an opportunity. And don't think, oh, I'm the best. I'm a Christian and my family's not. But just accept God has a place for you. And don't think yourself as unclean. He'll clean you up just fine. He already has. So we need shepherd type of humility where they simply just went. They were willing. They went and they were willing. God calls these men, I think, because of their faith, their reverence, because of their humility, but he also knows they will actually go and they will actually be the witnesses that he wants them to be. They will be good shepherds, not false shepherds. And, I, I, and God is looking for willing hearts. God wants willing hearts. He's not looking for the most qualified or the richest or the smartest. He's looking for willing people who will, who will share his truth and his love in this world that so desperately needs it, right? I, I, I struggle with this truth. I, I think it's a real truth because I believe in God's sovereignty and control, but I believe there are things that God can do in my life that don't get done. Not because of God, but because of my unwillingness. Right? I think there are things that could be better in this world because of the unwillingness of God followers sometimes. So, it, God isn't the one dropping the ball, right? He's asking people to go. Go is one of the simplest English words, right? Two letters, you shouldn't get that wrong on a spelling test, kids. G-O, right? Go. It's one of the most simple of words, but sometimes it's the hardest to be obedient to. God gives you a nudge to call somebody. Go, pick up the phone, right? God gives you a nudge to be part of one of our ministries or something. Oh, could I do that? Go, step, take the first step, right? It's, it's hard to be obedient. It's hard to go against that grain, We're, right? Go. It's hard to say, can I pray for you? Or, God, I want to learn how to parent better. I want to learn how to parent with faith. Or, I want to, God, I want... I want to see this relationship in my life reconciled. What part of it is mine? God, what am I supposed to go and do differently? Go. Are you willing to take that next step? There's, there's steps to Bethlehem from wherever they were. People were asking me how far they were from the stable, and the answer is we don't know. But I know they didn't get there if they didn't take that first step. That's what I know. In order to go, they had to take the step. So where do you want to go this upcoming year? Where do you want to grow? 
where is some ache or hurt in your life or where is some gap in your life where you need to mature or grow or is it giving more? Is it serving? Is it praying? Admit and take the first step, right? One simple prayer for willingness. Try this on. You can write it down if you like. One simple prayer for us all is simply this. God, make me increasingly willing to follow your will. God, make me increasingly willing to follow your will. And just pray that. It's not a psychological trick. I think the Holy Spirit will help you to be increasingly willing, and you'll look for opportunities to step up and to be obedient, just like the shepherds. They went, and then they told the story. They shared. That's the next thing. They shared. They shared. They shared their experience. Obviously, they shared it with Mary, Joseph, and whoever else was there. And let's keep in mind, and we talked about this in Bible studies, but that may seem like a no-brainer. They don't know Mary and Joseph's side of the story yet. They, they aren't living in the Bible. <laughs> so some of us sometimes assume, well, well okay, we're connecting the, the dots here. And so, but they don't know that Mary had an angelic encounter. They don't know that Joseph had an angel in a dream. They don't know about John the Baptist yet. 30 years down the road, they will. Right? So they're stepping out and saying, this might sound crazy to you, but man, we saw angels. Okay, they probably said it a little more reverent than that, right? And Mary and Joseph are like, oh yeah. God is doing this story. Think of the months that as Jesus grew inside of Mary and she'd had the angelic encounter and she had the experience with her cousin Elizabeth and she knew special things were going on, but she's not having an angel visit her every day. And what a gift on that night for God to come in to Joseph and Mary and say, yeah, you're not crazy. I know your talents are looking at you weird. I know your family thinks of you weird, but remember, this is my story and I'm inviting you in no matter if others are calling you outcasts, right? And so the shepherds, they share and they affirm Mary and Joseph in that way. And actually, the word there, they're, as they're sharing the good news, it's the word for evangelize. The, 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 the word for uh, it's, euangelion is just, it, it just means sharing the good news, right? They, they evangelize Mary and Joseph in a sense, sharing with them the good news that they heard and sharing that it was for all the people like the angels had told them, right? It's not for them to keep to themselves, right? They didn't let the greatness of the news overwhelm them. They shared what they had heard. <clears throat> I also think they would have shared wisely. Again, this is something else we talked about at Bible study. I want to encourage you, if you want to join Bible study during Advent to, to do that, feel free to do it. Um, oh, not Tina's tomorrow. Hers is canceled again. Sorry, I was supposed to announce that earlier. Anyway, um, they, they shared the information wisely. They're not the wise men, but they were maybe wiser than the wise men in this point. And wh- what do I mean by that? They, they share, we know they shared with people, but I don't think they blabbed foolishly. And there's a difference between sharing intentionally and prayerfully and, and, and just, you know, throwing your pearls before swine, as Jesus would say later. They didn't go out and share with people that might be in Herod's circle where the news might get back to Herod. I know that because we don't have a follow-up story of Herod getting angry at news he hears about these angels coming to, to the shepherds. We'll see that when we get to the wise men. They, they didn't know all the intricacies of, of that, and so they, they get Herod involved. But these guys, they, they share with discernment and wisdom, so they, they teach us that too. So they, there's a lot that we can learn from these shepherds is what I'm trying to say. But ultimately, he came to them so that we could learn from the shepherd, capital T, capital S, right? The shepherd. And what can we learn? We can learn that he sees, he frees, he leads, he feeds. He sees, frees, leads, feeds. Let's talk about he sees. He sees our need. He saw way back, of course, when Cain killed Abel. And, and he sees countries at war now. Right? And he, he saw the blood that we shed, the brokenness we have in families. He sees the pain and loss of this world. And he doesn't say, therefore, I'm done with them. He says, I'm going to come into it. And though they spill each other's blood, ultimately I'm going to give my blood. The Son of God says, I'm going to give my blood for them. 
he sees his sheep, and he doesn't want his sheep wandering and lost. So he comes to free us, right? He frees us. He comes to free us from the reality of being cast out of his family, of the reality of the, the, the things like Cain did to Abel, the brokenness of this world. He comes to free us from the sin that so easily entangles us in this life, like shepherds who free their sheep from difficult situations or, or take them out of a risky situation or away from a predator. God frees us and gives us the security of knowing that we are his beloved children, that he loves us and he's calling us into his life and gives us a purpose and life forever. He frees us. And then he leads us. He doesn't just leave us. He leads us. Jesus, as a shepherd, leads us. He he doesn't call us anywhere he isn't willing to go. Think about that. The great shepherd, he faced temptation, Jesus did. Temptation of all sorts, but never sinned. He faced loss. The Son of God faced human loss. He faces abandonment, he faces treachery, and of course, he faced death, our great shepherd. He leads us, as the shepherd psalm says, through the darkest valley, the valley, right? The shadow, the death of this world, he leads us through it. He is the firstborn also from the dead to lead us to new life and everlasting life. He's saying, come on, outcast, broken in the world. Come on into my family. I'm gonna lead you into your new life, your everlasting life. I'm gonna lead you. And then I'm gonna keep feeding you. He feeds us. So we, we come into this family, out, born as outcasts, born as sinners, but brought into the story. He grows us and continues to feed us with our daily bread. That's not just physical bread, but what we truly need for our spiritual growth. Right? He will provide. We have a great shepherd, right? You have a great shepherd. Do you ask him for what you need to grow? Jesus says you have not because you ask not, right? Ask and it will be given to you. Do you want to grow this year? Do you want deeper spiritual resources? Right? Do, you want to, do you want to find deeper meaning and purpose in your life? Pray for it. Boldly, humbly, courageously ask. He's a shepherd who gives, he feeds you with green pastures. He gives you the, the waters that can still your soul and fill you up. He gives new mercies every morning. He's the God who came that night of nights to humble shepherds, utterly changing their life, right, because he was coming that he could change all of our lives, that we would never be the same. He wants to come so we're not outcasts, but we live inside his family, right? Right? We want to reverse the American false gospel of Jesus comes and lives inside my heart. Reverse that and say Jesus invites us to come and live inside his heart. He wants us to live inside his new kingdom. He says, come and live inside my kingdom. You've been cast out. You've been broken in your human ways and the ways you treat each other, but I'm coming down into your world so that I can have you come and live inside my life, my kingdom, live as part of my body, my family. Come and live inside of his glorious wonderful kingdom. They were changed that night, but they still have a choice to say, are we gonna live inside this story? Is this story of the, what happened to us, guys, are we gonna live inside that, what happened to us? Like any human, they could just kind of grow cold to what God did for them and disregard it later in their life, a year later, 10 years later, oh yeah, I guess it happened, but they chose to not take the story for granted, and I would just say that you don't take the story, don't take the Christmas story for granted. Don't use it as an excuse to just buy more junk, right? Don't take it for granted. Live inside the deep story. I I believe they stayed faithful. I can't prove this to you, but I believe they smartly and continuously pass the story on. And 30 years later, when John the Baptist came, there was a groundswell movement ready for him of people that had been hearing the stories over the years and decades that there was a Messiah baby born 30 years ago. And then a guy comes from the outside coming and saying, repent, get your life straight, prepare, the Lord is coming. And people said, oh yeah, I heard a shepherd tell me that one time. I'm gonna go out and get dunked by this wild man. 
So I'm saying, when we have an experience with Jesus, never take for granted that he could use your bit of that story next year, 10 years from now, 30 years from now, and weave it all together, because he's God. He can do that. So rest and rejoice in him. Rest and rejoice in this story. May this story bring you deep peace, the Christmas story, the story of God bringing the outcasts in. They returned and they were glorifying and praising God, right? What does that feel like for them? Whatever burdens they had that night, they still had, you know, the troubles at home that they had to go home to or whatever. But were they changed? Did they feel different? Were they different? Yes. And when you come to worship together or you worship at home and you're working through whatever life issues you have, when you rest and rejoice in the Lord and you receive his resources, there are real things happening to you. The Holy Spirit is real. He's giving you real encouragement, right? Real strength. And he will help you to then go and rest in his strength for whatever's going on in your life, your health, and in this world, right? Rejoice and be glad, for we have a God who became human. Rejoice. It is good for your soul. Rejoice. We must keep on gathering together, right? And we will this season, and, and rejoice. This is the center of who we are, is rejoicers. God glorifiers, if we want to say it that way. A Christian who is without rejoicing, without praise in their life, and I'm not just talking about songs, I'm talking about the spirit of rejoicing in the goodness of God. If you look at your life and say, I'm not a rejoicer, I'm, I'm a Christian but not a rejoicer, I would say, be careful, you may not be a Christian at all. If you don't rejoice at the goodness of God, then what are you really, what are you believing in? Rejoice. And as you rejoice, share and grow. It must have been, it would have been, I should say, ridiculous if the shepherds did not share the story. I think we'd agree on that. It would have been ridiculous if the shepherds stayed the same spiritually that day and they look at their life 20 years later and they say, yeah, I'm about the same. Right? Instead, I bet that night, though it was an amazing night, and the greatest thing they saw that night, of course, was the baby Jesus, right? But that night started a journey for them, I'm sure where they continued to be curious what God was gonna do next, where they continued to be prayerful, praying for that Messiah baby that they'd seen, where they, where they were studious in hearing God's word and talking about it, where they were learning about the Lord. It would have been ridiculous if the shepherds stayed at the same spiritual level they were that night. But that's sometimes what we have. We have ridiculous spiritual lives sometimes where we just stay too long in a level that we're at. God wants to grow you this season. He always wants to grow you because he's a good shepherd. And a good shepherd grows his his flock and his sheep. He wants to have you be curious again and that's good for you. He wants to have you be prayerful and studious and learning and deepening this year. So if you have heard the good news of great joy, it is ridiculous to not grow and it's ridiculous to not share it. Find ways to share it wisely and authentically through your life. Find ways this season to be curious about the Lord and the story, but also the story he's involving you in. Be curious about how you could grow in prayer and how you could be part of living inside his story and serving others, right? And one day, as we, as we wait for the next advent, as we live in this life of growing, we, we are living as people who are waiting, watching for the great shepherd to return. When he's gonna bring all of his outcasts in, all he is pleased in, who have actually believed in him and received his love, those who are readying themselves for the day of the shepherd's return, right? That's what Advent can be used for this season, to call us to watch and prepare for the great shepherd to return. Lord God, I pray uh, that we would just ponder the deep lessons of the shepherds and the deep lessons of of Jesus, the great shepherd, in this season. And and Lord, help us to see that through Jesus, we, 
no longer need to be outcasts. We are invited to live inside your family. This is good news, Lord. But we come to the communion table and we recognize again together that in order for us to be brought in, you had to be cast out. Though you never knew sin by experience, you experienced sin in a sense by, by taking it, our sin upon yourself and experiencing death and wrath. And, and Lord, as we come to this communion table, we, we want to rest and rejoice in the sacrifice of Jesus, the great shepherd. May this be a, a starting point for somebody here today, like that night was a starting point for some of those shepherds of a new way of living, Lord. May today be a, a starting point for someone here, a starting point of renewal or a starting point of new hope in their life. I don't know, Lord, but your Holy Spirit can use this communion celebration to help your people today. So I ask you, Lord, please help us to remember you and give thanks for your sacrifice. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I want to invite the communion servers up to help serve uh, the Lord's Supper today. I want to invite you to consider uh, celebrating this meal. Uh, you don't have to be a member of our local church to, to celebrate communion here. Um, if, if you believe in the Son of God who was born into the world and became our Savior, died on the cross for us and rose from the dead for us. If you believe in him and you want to give thanks for his life and his sacrifice, then I invite you to this meal today. Do consider it uh, and consider that you're, you're taking it for the right reasons. I ask you, nobody to take it because somebody next to him's taking it. If you don't know what it means or you're not sure if you should take it, just, just, just kind of be here. Uh, if you know that you shouldn't take it for some spiritual reason, then then don't. Uh, but for those who are ready and, and want to and are willing to, I invite you to this meal. I'm going to have the servers pass out uh, the bread, and if you want to partake in it, take one and hold on to it, and then we'll partake of it together. <coughs> So, um, 
forgot to announce, and this is awkward, but uh, these are gluten-free. Um, so if you didn't take one, because you, uh, if, if, if anybody wants one, we can, you can come up afterwards or whatever, but we're going to just have gluten-free, uh, if you want to call it bread, uh, from here on out, just to make that choice easy for everybody. Uh, but back to what Jesus did. Um, he was with his friends at the table. He knew, um, talk about awkward, that one of them was going to turn him in. And he also knew that he would then soon be arrested and tortured and executed. But that was part of his story, part of his plan to be the great shepherd who came to free his flock. And so they were having that Passover meal together, and he took a piece of the bread and he broke it. He said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Each time you eat of it, remember me. God, your blood was shed so that you could heal us from the, way, the ways we shed each other's blood. You were, you were broken so that we could be mended and made whole. Thank you for being the great shepherd. As we're about to hold um, the cup, Lord, may your Holy Spirit remind us and renew us of the, in the new covenant that you gave your life blood to to make us new, to make and to seal your promises that we are forgiven and we are invited into your family. So Lord, renew us in this covenant, your covenant. Remind us of the price paid, but also the joy of getting to be your children and your family. I pray this in, in Jesus' name. Jesus at that same 
meal, took one of the cups that was part of that Passover meal. And he said, this is the cup of the new covenant. It was made in his blood, which was shed for the forgiveness of our sins. And he said, each time you drink of it, remember me. And one of the important ways we remember and rejoice is through singing. So if you're able, would you please stand and rejoice together, and we're going to sing Angels from the Realms of Glory. seated. Would the ushers please come forward and receive our, our regular offerings and any of those Christmas offerings and also your connect card if you have anything you want to share on that connect card. Let's pray. God, bless what is given here today, whether it's for our, our regular ministry and, and expenses or for these Christmas offerings, Lord. Uh, please bless what is given and use it all to tell your story. Pray in Jesus' name.
May you go from here glorifying and praising God today for the good news of great joy. Some next steps to consider is we could go wanting to share the story like those shepherds, but we could also just go thanking uh, God for being our shepherd. And maybe you can find those eight to 15 people in your life that you could be praying for every day and sharing the good news of great joy. Let's rest and rejoice in his hope. Have a great Advent. Hope to see you around and uh, join us in fellowship if you can. And have a great week. God loves you.